Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por, por venir también. Como, como sabeu, esta actividad se enmarca dentro de, del Festival Demo, que portem ya fent desde el dilluns amb todas las actividades que hayan agut. Eh, avui es el dijous, seguimos aquí en un workshop que ha fet aquest matí a Lex amb los estudiantes de l'ISABA, que ahora veurem también unas imatges del que han estat fent amb la conferencia del seu treball y después seguimos amb, a la Galería de Damo una exposición. Um, una mica es lo que digo a Oscar, ya ja portem los tres años, las tres ediciones de demo, ya ja hemos colaborado amb, amb la Escuela Lisaba, que siempre desde el inicio antes va estar bien al proyecto de demo, ya ja volgut ser participar de ahí, y resta, tenemos la suerte de, de haber podido portar el, el Lex, que creemos que es un gran referente entre todos aquests termes de, de nuevas formas de hacer, de nuevas formas de entender el diseño, la experimentación y la materialidad, y re, contentos de que esté aquí y que el podamos compartir con vosotros. Muchas gracias a todos, Lex. Uh, thank you very much, and first of all for being here. It's been a great pleasure also this morning. I saw some faces from the workshop already from this morning. Um, what I want to do is tell you a bit about my work, how I work, uh, what I do, where we work, and what kind of projects we normally do. Uh, feel free to ask questions. I mean, maybe during the presentation or afterwards, yeah, feel free to ask them. What I actually want to do is uh, tell you a bit from the beginning, where I started and how I started. I studied in Eindhoven at uh, Design Academy. I graduated in 2009, and it still feels a bit like I graduated yesterday, but I'm already working for eight years. Uh, when I just graduated, I worked a bit freelance for some other designers to gain some experience to see how the actual design field was working. Uh, I worked for Helle Jongerius, a Dutch designer, she's now based in Berlin, and for another Dutch studio called Scholten and Bayings. They do a lot for Hay, for a Danish company. And it taught me a lot how the design industry was working, because in the academy you are trained to be a designer, but you have absolutely no clue how the field is actually working. And one of the things that I found out was that the Salone del Mobile in Milan is a very important fair to take part in. And I now did it for 10 years in a row, also when I was studying. And this is actually the first year that I didn't go myself. I had some works with galleries and labels, but I didn't decide to go because it's like a roller coaster and you get home really exhausted, totally drunk still. Um, but it's fun, you meet a lot of good people. And the nice thing about Milan is that actually the whole world is coming there. So you don't have to put too much effort into reaching people because they will come to you. And one of the first things in Milan that I showed was at the Fitra booth, uh, the Swiss company. They always put some other objects of designers inside the booth. And it was actually a woman that I met uh, through a blog, because I think the design blogs are a very easy way of reaching people and getting your work out there. I mean, it's for free. 20 years ago, we only had magazines as a medium to show your work and to communicate your work. But nowadays, the blogs are a per perfect medium to show it all over the world. So that's how I got in touch with the people from Vitra. I showed some mirrors and also some vases. And it was actually like a snowball that my work started to roll and got more known. And all the works that I showed there, like the, the mirror and the vases, they were really prototypes. I made them in the studio by myself. And it was really a lot of experimentation. And because of Milan, you see that you reach producers and labels that want to take it into the collection. So I want to start with this project uh, of oxidized mirrors. I did it together with a friend of mine, David Derksen. And uh, we actually, in, in general, we work a lot with pure materials, preferably natural materials, elements, wood, stone, metals. And what we found out is that sometimes in very old bathrooms, uh, you see these silver mirrors with black spots that they start to oxidize. And we were wondering what happens in between the black spots and the perfect silver, because it's a transformation process. And we found out that actually there's a whole color range. The colors are not that well, but it actually goes from silver to bronze to blue to purple. And this was one of the prototypes. We made it and it worked at once. So what we actually did, we put some stickers on the, on the mirror. We removed the paint coating, so it was just the pure silver on the glass. And we put it in a sulfur solution in a bath, and every 30 seconds we removed one sticker. So that's why you really get these organized steps from light to dark. And this was the first prototype, and it went perfect. And then we showed it on an exhibition. We made a family of mirrors, and then 
between the prototypes and this mirror was two years of developing the technique. Because then we got orders and we had to reproduce it and everything that you can imagine went wrong. So we spent two years on developing the technique and nowadays we have a producer in Italy that produces the mirrors for us. Um, and it took also a year to develop things. So sometimes the experiment can go really well, but before you have it in production, it takes a very long time. And one of the things in my work which is really important is that we develop a method or a way of working. And then in the end, the shape is less important. So for this project, as you can see here, it's a bit clouded because it was all made with liquid. So it's very uneven to oxidize it. And then we decided since the pattern is so yeah, organic in a way, we wanted to have very rational geometric shapes. And because we knew the technique and we could use it, we also got asked a lot by private clients or commissions to do big walls, hotels. And this is a project we did recently in Amsterdam for a hotel, which is 145 mirrors. In every room they wanted one. And it was also a funny project because hotel rooms can never cost that much but they want to have everything as beautiful as possible. And they were cutting down the costs of everything, of the shelf, of the carpet, of the paint. And of course, they also wanted to cut down our costs. And then we said, no, I'm sorry, this is the price. And uh, it's actually one of the eye catchers of the room because everything is quite basic, quite neutral, and this is sort of a very shiny thing. So the negotiation went back and forth around three months to say yes, no, yes, no. And then we said, this is the price, let us know if you don't want it, no hard feelings, then we don't hear from you. And then they said, the project is canceled unless you fix the price. And we said, well, yeah, sure, that's no problem. And then two months later, they said, yes, we want to do it and the price is okay. So sometimes it's also good to be a bit on the low and a bit quiet and just wait for it. So the mirrors are still ongoing, but we're not producing them ourselves because we developed the technique and we could simply transfer all the knowledge. Um, yeah. uh, this is another project that I wanted to show because lately I've been working more and more in commissions. Uh, I was asked by the Ministry of Finance in the Netherlands. I don't know if they do it here as well, but we have commemorative coins. So for a special occasion, they make a euro coin and it's divided within every country. So every country has their own coin, but the flip side has to be special uh, for the national side as well. So this was the 50th anniversary of the World Wildlife Fund and I thought, okay, I've never designed a coin, so how am I going to do this? And because it was the World Wildlife Fund, I wanted to do something with the flora and the fauna to combine those two worlds in metal. And I thought about the, the conceptual side as well, that humans on nature, they leave a footprint. And I thought a coin is actually nothing more than an ecological footprint as well. It's just a stamp hitting a piece of metal very hard. And I thought, what if I design a piece uh, which is made by animals and also stamped in a way? So I decided to use the most, one of the most heaviest animals in the world, an elephant, to make a footprint, which is not only a footprint for ecological reasons, but also for uh, environmental and literally stamping the material. So I asked the zoo in Amsterdam if I could borrow the elephant for a day. It had to go through some commissions, but in the end they approved it and I could use the elephant for one day. And I, here you can see it on the right side. Uh, the elephants are actually trained to lift their foot uh, because they are trained to get a pedicure or a manicure, you know, for, the, for their nails. They need maintenance on the nails. So they lift their foot and I put the bucket of sand under it and then they lowered the foot because one uh, elephant is around eight or 9,000 kilograms. So it's very, very dangerous as well. And that's why you see the bars over there because you're not allowed to stand close or next to the elephant because two years ago there was one of the helpers or the assistants, he was squeezed to death against the wall. So it was quite sort of a lot of safety rules that we had to follow, but luckily it went well. And here you can see the footprint and then later on I made the typography around it with the value and the subject. And on the other side I wanted to do something with plants or the growth of the nature. So I decided to use trees as a metaphor. And because it was the 50th anniversary I wanted a tree that was exactly 50 years old, born in the same year. And on the left, I went to a, a wood company that sells wood and logs. And it, spam, it, it took me almost half a day to count all the rings because it was always 45, 48, 53. 
And in the end, I found one with 50 years. And I was experimenting with a technique called sun blasting, where you put very high pressured air and sand on the, the wood texture. And normally it's used a lot in furniture as a texture or as a surface treatment. And the nice thing what happens is that the summer rings of a tree, they are more soft because in summertime a tree grows really fast. And in wintertime it keeps all its energy together. So it's really hard and compact. And if you touch it with the same pressure, the summer rings go away and the winters they stay. So you get a very nice texture. You can see it here. I made a plaster model of it. Because in a coin you can't use color or any other material, so it really has to be the reflection of light. And of course the queen had to be on it, which was one of the regulations. And when I had this presentation, they expected proposals of 29 and 23 millimeter, but I came in with these big discs of 60 centimeters. And it was one of the most frustrating projects that I did so far because they made a, a test stamp. So they really made the die, the official coin. And in the end, it was not chosen for technical reasons, political reasons. It's really, really complicated, the coin. I will get back to that later, my frustration with coins. Um, but the, the worst thing is they made one coin. So I had my own coin in my hand. But by law, it says that it has to be destroyed. So they had to... yeah kill it or put it through the shredder, which is really a pity. Um, but anyhow, as I said, I work a lot with natural materials. In general, it's mostly wood, stone and metals. And within those materials, I always try to find new resources and new ways of expressing those. Um, here I asked literally to the Dutch Forest Council if I could have a tree for a project. And they said, yeah, sure, you can have one. We're sort of chopping the trees to give life and space to new trees. And one of the funny things is when he cut the tree, the guy, he also wanted to chop off all the branches to make it very regular and fit for industry, reproducible. And I said, no, 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 please leave it on because it's a very hard connection that actually no carpenter can make. So I decided to make it into a key feature of the furniture design because actually this is one plank and this is all one piece which a carpenter could never make. So it's very reproducible, but every tree and every table is slightly unique. So sometimes it's a bit more diagonal, a bit more straight. And of course, these pieces were very yeah, labor intensive and difficult to make. So I only sold a few to some collectors and some museum. And another thing that I noticed is that if they cut a tree, they always throw away the outer parts because they are irregular and they have a difficult silhouette. And in industry, they want to have everything straight and everything the same. So in every tree, they throw away about 30% of the tree or 30% of the wood before they can even start using it as wood. And I said, no, 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 please keep everything together as one complete tree. And then we cut it in different proportions to make a lot of shelving units. So here's a long, thick one, a skinny, short one. Um, and in the end, I made a lot of different variations. They're all custom made. So depending on how long or how, how high they want them, uh, I can produce them. Well, the work that I've showed now was quite yeah, labor intensive. It always ended up with galleries and it, I couldn't even afford my own work because I really had to sell it in order to stay alive. And then I thought I want to find more of a connection towards industry and really working with mass production. And I decided to think of standardization. So I went to Milan again for an exhibition and I was thinking in steel, very basic sheets of steel. How big is it? How efficient can you laser cut it? And I worked on a project with circles. It's really, really simple. You just have a circle which always has one cut to the center point, but then they are folded into different directions. So you get a small shelf for inside a corner, for around a corner, and also a flat one. And I had this in Milan, just hoping for some labels to come by. And then luckily I met the people of Hay, a Danish company that sells a lot of home accessories. And they have it in production now, which for me was a great step towards mass production and also understanding how this whole system works. And yeah, actually the only criteria is of course that it has to look nice, but also that it has to be very, very efficient and cheap to produce. And I got a lot better at it. And I also see it in a lot of products that exist, why they are actually made way they are because of price mostly um, and the funny thing is that this is a project that I really wanted to show because normally 
all the designs, they have to be quite conceptual or there's a big process behind it. But I was making podiums for Milan, you know, like cubes to present the work. And I was cutting all the podiums under 45 degrees angles in the studio. So it, yeah, you have a nice glue seam. And at the end of the day, I was cleaning the studio and I found this little block, you know, just one shape, which was actually an off cut. So I was cleaning everything. And I thought, wow, it's actually pretty nice, which was two days before Milan. And I looked around in the studio and I thought, yeah, what can it be, what can it be? And I hold it against the wall and I thought, okay, maybe a hook. So I cut some more, 20 more. I sprayed them with spray paint, really bad paint. I put a screw in the back and I showed it at Hay the first day in Milan. And they said, yeah, well, great idea. Let's put it in the collection. So it can also be very, very simple to get something in production. It doesn't need a concept. Because, yeah, of course, you make a little story behind it to make it interesting, but it had no concept at all. Um, this is one of my personal favorite projects, which uh, actually started with a self-initiated work, and later on it was also picked up by industry, and some of the people in the workshop, they know how it works a bit now, with oxidizing metals, because I never really used color in my work, it was always wood has a wood color, stone is stone, and I looked at roofs of churches and statues on squares and they are ox always oxidized or they have a patina. And the nice thing is that you can tell by the color of the patina which metal it's made from because every metal has its own specific color. So I did a research on different chemicals and different color combinations. And the first outcome, well, I had to develop a lot of recipes because it's very similar to cooking. You add a bit of salt, you add a bit of nitrate, and it really influences the color a lot. So this was a lot of testing, trial and error. And this was the first conclusion I made, a very abstract sort of decorative piece of samples where each time you see the, the, the metal in the cultivated state, so really polished, and then the chemical reaction which is taking place. And to me, this is an interesting one because it's brass, and brass is an alloy of copper and zinc and together it makes uh, brass and copper oxide is red and zinc oxide is white and if you mix the white and the red together in molecules it becomes a bit pinkish so this is a very complicated one not the most beautiful one because I think the, uh, the blue is a bit more appearing uh, but a very interesting one and this is exactly how I design products it's not so much of thinking what I want to do but more being guided by what I know and what the technique wants. So these are very simple tubes. I bought them in the hardware store. I oxidized them and I put them on the turning bench and I scraped off a piece. And then I thought, yeah, they look really nice, but what can it be? So I made it into vases to put flowers in. And I showed them in Milan as well to a Danish company and they have them in production now. And one funny story about this is that each vase is slightly unique because it's a natural process or it's a liquid process, so you can't make them perfectly the same. And the first batch that was produced, I think it was around 20,000 pieces, so two containers full. There was one person from the company doing the quality control or the quality check, and they canceled everything because they said they are not the same, they are not perfect quality. So we cancel everything and they called me really in panic. They said, yeah, we have 20,000 vases, what do we do? I said, yeah, what's the problem? And they said, yeah, they're not exactly the same. And I said to them, yeah, that's the whole idea, so please bring them in, they look perfect. And people actually quite like it because in the shop there's always two or three and they try to choose the one they like. Uh, so this is some images of the, of the company. And this is a more experimental work and for me, it's always really important to see a project as an evolution. So when I start a project, it continues for five or six years. And I was asked by a Dutch gallery to do a free project, and I decided to do something with wood. And it actually came from the coin with the sunblasting, because this was this texture of the wood. And I decided to make it more extreme. So I did a lot of testing in different types of wood, see how it worked out. And I thought if you make the wood very, very thin, you can actually go through it all the way or you can make it transparent. And in the end, we found out it's maybe a bit technical, but you have wood which is cut in different ways. You can have it rift sawn, quarter sawn, normal sawn. And we used quarter sawn. And actually what it does is that all the lines of the rings are vertical in a, in a straight direction. See if I have an example here. No, 
of a cheaper wood is always cut with a bigger flame, so you see more pattern. And in the end, we found out that with Douglas pine, it works really well because it's soft wood and the contrast is very high. So we made a collection of room dividers. This is one of the biggest pieces. And what I quite like is that you really see the DNA of the tree, where it starts from the first year and you really open it up like an X-ray image. Uh, we also made some comps, uh, some matches, of course, because what I found really important is that I could never afford my own work. So I wanted people that liked the ID that they could also buy it. So we have the matches, they are 10 or 15 euros until, well, crazy amounts for the room divider. Uh, so for me, it was really important to make a collection in all price ranges with the same ID. And yeah, a cabinet as well. Here you see a bit of an overview, half abstract pieces and half more semi-functional pieces. And in the end, uh, well, they say no guts, no glory. And we had so much research for this project. We talked a lot with wood specialists, how this whole process went. And we had so much documentation. So we went to a Dutch publisher, Frame Magazine, probably some of you know it. Uh, and we asked if they wanted to publish a book about this whole process. And we didn't expect anything. We expected them to say no, but luckily they said yes. So they printed the book and it actually also became a product from the process. So this is the first time that the whole story became a product as well. And this is uh, actually my graduation project because I graduated in 2009. And all my teachers said, no, don't do this project. It's not going to work. It's too crazy. It's too difficult. But luckily, I wanted to try it. And I wanted to make a table out of one big stone. So it's around six or 7,000 kilos, so really crazy heavy. And it felt more like choreography, because it's so heavy, you cannot touch it. You, you, yeah, you, you, be ha you have to be a director, in a way. So I went to the source, which is in Belgium. It's a quarry where they take the stone out of the ground. And I wanted to have a contrast between the organic shape of the crack lines, where it deforms in the earth, and the very rational geometry that they use in industry. So here you see some of the split lines on the block, which is just layers in the earth, because it's a horizontal stone. So it, yeah, it grows over the years, or millions of years, actually. And here's to give you an impression of the, the saw or the machines they use. This saw is around six meters high, so really twice this room. So it's an immense industry and everything is so heavy and uncontrollable. Um, here you see the base and the, the tabletop being cut before it's really being processed. And as I said, the stone has a horizontal structure. So it grows in the earth in horizontal layers, which means that this direction is the weak direction and this direction is very strong. So we cut it in the strong direction and then we could literally split it with a hammer. You can break out the pieces. So in a way, it was almost like sculpting a table. Here you can see it on the right, uh, where we were breaking out these pieces. This was actually a commission for a client in Brussels. And by now, I sold around seven or eight of these tables. And in five cases, they had to change the foundation of the house because it was too heavy. Otherwise, it would go through the floor, which is still my nightmare that I got a phone call one day. And they say it crushed my Porsche or uh, my Ferrari. <laughs> Don't blame me. Um, and of course, since it's so heavy, we also really had to think about transportation and packaging. So we made custom-made frames. And here's a very big bolt. And there's four bolts. So we put it in place in the house with a forklift or with a pump jacket. And then we lower the bolts, and it's at the right place. So I always have to ask five times, is it in the right place? Is it in the right place? Because you can never move it again. And even if they want to move it, they probably have to call me. This is another one in Canada where they actually had to do the foundation of the house twice as thick to support the weight. Um, but it's really fun because what I always do in these projects is that I make a total project. So I say we do the design, the production, the shipping, and the installation on site that I really know that it's being done well. And I always ask two guys from the stone company to ensure that it's going well. Because if one piece breaks, the whole table is gone because it's one solid piece. And this image, uh, to me, is quite funny because in nature, you can scale everything down and up because a small rock is the same as a big rock. 
and I made this myself at home with a with a handsaw. So I was cutting cutting strips, and it's exactly the same as the big table. And I photographed it in such a way that you cannot see the scale or the reference of scale. And I sold five tables from this picture where they said, "I want to have this table." And I say, yeah, I'm sorry, it's sold, but I can make you a new one. And actually what we did is, this is the scale model. They don't know, of course. And this is one of the big ones we made. So it's quite similar, I think. Of course, it's different. But that's the funny thing of making scale models, that you can literally grow or scale it down. This was done for a museum in Stockholm. Luckily, museums are already strong and reinforced with floors, because artists are always doing crazy things. Um, and this project is sort of helping me out to start my own studio because I think some of you in the room, they want to start their own studios and of course survive and make a bit of money. And in the beginning, I didn't really work with royalties, with labels, but more making something and selling something. And I showed you the, the coin proposal for the World Wildlife Fund. That was actually only one which was rejected and afterwards I did four more. So I did five proposals and none of them were executed. So I was really, really frustrated with money. I said, I'm never going to design a coin anymore. I'm going to destroy money now for a project. And what I basically did is the euros, um, they are owned by every state or every company or every country. And in the Netherlands, we have a monarchy. So the highest is the king or the queen. And technically the money is owned by the royals or by the king or the queen. And what I did is I made jewels out of it, jewelry, and I called it crown jewels because it's still owned by the state, but I sort of use it, uh, or I borrow it, the money. And the question that I always get is whether it's illegal or not. And the funny thing is it's not illegal because if you change money and you use it as money, you get really high punishments. But if you change the function, it's legal. It's even in the European law where it said if it's for artistic or creative purposes and you change the function, they cannot do anything. So I made it into jewelry, which is different. And I showed these in an exhibition in Eindhoven for the Dutch Design Week. And then people actually wanted to buy it. So I was quite surprised as well because it was more of a joke. And I think by now I sold around 15 or 20,000. I didn't count them exactly. Um, and I sell them for 20 euros. So it's really easy profit, you can say, from 10 cents to 20 euros. And the good thing is actually, um, I pay because I do everything official, so I have to pay VAT, 21%. So the state gets three and a half euros for every 10 cents, which is like a magical trick for them as well. So they should be the last to complain. Uh, but this project really helped me to start my studio and to invest in new projects. It's not the most difficult project, but sometimes a very simple product can have a big range to start your own studio. Um, this is uh, another project that I did for a Danish company and a London-based magazine, wallpaper magazine. Every year in Milan, they have wallpaper handmade where they connect a designer to a company. And I was connected to a robot bending company and a craftsman, a metal smith which was a weird combination. So I thought I had to do something with industry and with craftsmanship. And I was inspired by Japanese scissors that were made out of one piece. Normally a scissor is always two, three or four pieces screwed together or with injection molding done together. And I wanted to challenge myself to make an industrial scissor out of one piece. So this is a robot wire bending machine and I made the silhouette of a symmetrical scissor. So you can use it for left and right handed people. And of course the blades now, they are rounded, so they, yeah, they are not sharp anymore. So I used the smith uh, to hammer the blades or to forge the blades. This was of course a prototype. I only made a few for the exhibition in Milan. And then a Danish company decided to mass produce them. And the good thing is the robot technique stayed the same. And for this shape, for the blades, they made a die or a steel mold. Uh, so you just put it in, it hammers it flat and you have the perfect shape. And it's very, very sharp. But to me, the prototyping is always the nicest. To work with craftsmen that have a lot of knowledge, uh, even in the right angle of the blades. I thought a scissor was really easy, but it's actually a very, very complicated piece. Uh, so we made a bunch to test and to see, and then it was launched in Milan. And these are some of the first commercial uh, prototypes. 
And this is one of the first production samples, which is actually much more consistent. It maybe has a bit less charm than the handmade one, where you see really see the handwriting. Um, but they are actually doing quite well. So there's a lot of different ways of approaching a project. Sometimes it's a commission, sometimes it's for a gallery, sometimes it's, it's for a mass producer. Um, but in general, I would like to work as less on commissions as possible. So I always prefer to do my own free work and then finding the right partner to get it into the world. Uh, this is a company I did for an Italian uh, producer. It's called Abet Laminati. They were very big during the Memphis time with Mendini and Sotsas. And then for 30 years they have been forgotten, but they got really big during the Memphis and now they want to transform with new designers. And these are all paper models that I made because what they do is they produce laminate sheets, so very thin colored material. And I think... No, this is just painted. But you see it a lot in IKEA, where they produce these big tabletops. All the sides have the same color, but actually it's hollow in the inside. And I, I find it a bit fake, because in IKEA, if you lift it, you think, yeah, you feel that it's hollow. So I decided to give every surface another color, because they make flat material. I think it's also interesting that a three-dimensional object um, literally has lots of different surfaces. So what I did is I made objects with a lot of different angles. So for instance, this is a shelf made in paper as a small model. And if you look at it from the top on the left, it's gray and pink. And if you look at it from the right bottom, it's green and blue. So in a way, it makes the material more honest because it tells what it is and it doesn't fake that it's a solid object. And we made a whole collection out of it, some cabinets, some more abstract pieces. And now I'm talking to some producers to mass production, which is not that easy. Uh, and these are some of the real, uh, the real models. So I think, yeah, and this is again the transformation from paper models into real models. And it never got further than a, a prototype, so now I really hope that within one or two years, uh, sale, maybe even at IKEA, who knows? So that's basically it, and thanks a lot for the attention. And maybe there's some questions. Feel free. Or criticism. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. It's really pure new materials. And since it was really also a process, I started with the panels and the vases, and now I'm also even doing perfume bottles, shelves. I did a proposal for Volvo to coat some cars. <laughs> to, 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 to coat some cars, so it's really interesting. And of course, I always use new metal. And what you can do is if you have old patinas, you can simply sand it or make it fresh again because the patina will only stick to pure metal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually really funny because I'm in the middle of it now. We also had a discussion about it. When I started, I had nothing, you know, so you're really super creative to make something from nothing and now I've been working for I've been working for eight years and actually it got more comfortable you know you get companies you get suppliers you get craftsmen and after the I think especially the last four years you get more and more commissions more and more work and the last months I did 36 projects at the same time and I felt I'm going crazy you know it's not about creativity anymore it's about delivering so it's a good question because I decided from July 1st I don't want to work with staff anymore no employees no interns but just work alone no commissions no clients and close the studio for half a year or a year and just go back to where I started make my own stuff uh, try out things make mistakes and the good thing is, that took me eight years, but if I open the studio again, I have a lot to show and I have a lot to put in the right channel. So I can call the right people and say, 
you want to do this, you want to do that. But I really want to be more creative because it doesn't always mean that the more work you do or the more labels you work with, that it makes it nicer or more interesting. Uh, well, and also one of the things in working with companies is that they are really, really slow. Like, hey, a very simple product from the prototype to when it's in the shop, it's normally around two years and maybe even three years. So it means that if you want to make money out of it, you have a gap of two years and somehow you have to find a way to bridge it. So it doesn't always mean that the royalties are so comfortable and so nice as long as you have a long breath or a long time frame. Uh, th yeah, this is my first time. I think it's also a loop because the funny thing is when I just graduated, I was aiming for where designers five or ten years above me were. That you think, okay, they're doing this and this. I also want to go there. And now I realize that it's also not heaven, but you want to make another step. So now I'm talking, I'm actually consulting a lot of designers that I admire or that I like just to have a coffee with them and ask how they organize their studio, what their aims are, what their goals are. And it's really funny that it changes, I don't know exactly, but let's say five or seven years that you want to do something new or you want to change it. So for me, it's really constantly about searching for a method that fits and that works. And that is also still fun. All right. Yeah. So you were talking, well, sorry. Uh, you were talking before about experimentation, but also about um, the idea that no, this had no concept behind. So, what's the relation between concept and experimentation in your in your work, and what does come first, or how does it? Well, one of the reasons why I experiment a lot is, is so much is that I try to understand the real DNA or the true value of a material. So I try to listen really well to how wood wants to behave or what metal wants to do. And the more mistakes I make, the more I realize that it's the wrong choices. So I really try to get to the essence of a material. Mm -hmm. And if I were, of course, sometimes there's a concept involved, but one of the difficulties for me about a concept is that people will always interpret it in a different way and it also makes it one dimensional. That's for instance one of the beauty, beautiful things about poetry. It's very simple, it's only a few words, but if you ask 10 people, the meaning is always different. And of course there's a concept and a story behind the poetry for the maker or the writer. And I see it the same with my work. I, I can talk about the work with 10 different people and have 10 different conversations. One is more about the conceptual side, the production side, the development side, the technical side. So I, I don't want to promote it that much because I think it's also something for the viewer or for the person that uses it or sees it in the end. Uh, so I try to work with concepts quite often, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be a starting point. It can also yeah, like a puzzle fall together at a later stage. Yeah, because if I look at your work, it feels like your concept, or well, your ideas are more a description of what happened or what it is, rather than an abstraction of what it means. Is yeah, that? Well, yeah, that's true. And in a way, I, I want the pieces to be sort of self-explanatory because one of the things that I noticed lately, for instance, in food, that people also want to know where it came from, how it was produced, sort of very pure and unprocessed. And I believe in design we should follow the same path of using honest materials. And that sort of, if you see an object, you understand how it was made, what it was. So by conceptualizing it more and more, and of course I was trained this way because I studied in Eindhoven and it's really conceptual to the max. Um, but I found out that it doesn't necessarily always lead to the best outcome because I had a funny discussion about it this afternoon as well, that people think and talk a lot about design, but in the end, for me, the object has to justify the story or has to justify the meaning behind it. So it's a very gray area, I think, but in the end, as a designer, I believe that the medium is the object, so that should do the talking. Or the, uh okay. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, I mean, two things, but let's say about the artisan or the craftsman, I think we all need them really, really a lot. So what I always do, I mean, in Europe and in the Netherlands, more and more production is disappearing to Asia, to Eastern Europe. But all my prototypes, I want to develop them in the Netherlands. So really with craftsmen that they are really, really well made and that I also use their knowledge uh, for getting the right object. And one of the aims, like, like the planet or the, the footprint we have on the planet, one of the things that I hope and that I really believe in is sustainability, not in a green way, you know, not like we use the right materials and it's not polluting, because it ended up as being marketing, you know, Volkswagen, they lie about the city. It's, it's just a marketing campaign, but my definition of sustainability is making objects that last for a long time, that people don't buy it for half a year or a year, but they really see it as a conscious decision, whether the materials are good, whether it's well made, that it will also last for 20 years. And one thing that really worries me, and that's why I also want to take a step back, is the speed of design. If you go to Milan, they have one or two collections a year, and it's getting really, really similar to fashion, where they have four, or sometimes even six or eight collections a year and fashion became disposable and I really hope that design does not get disposable so therefore I really hope that designers take the responsibility to make products that will last um, in a longer lifetime and also have a certain emotional value for people that they buy it consciously without making everything green and sustainable because I think it's more a commercial aspect and if they find something new they drop the whole sustainable thing and we still have a lot of products to deal with so it's a, it's a difficult topic because when I was in school I also thought why should I design a chair we have so many nice ones and we have so many good ones but I think every chair or every object tells something about the time you live in and the time we exist whether it's technological whether there's things happening around us and I heard a comparison a while ago and it's like uh, it was quite beautiful I think he compared uh, design with pop songs, you know, like music. And you have pop songs which are one day flies, like the fashion of H&M, for instance. And you have classic pop songs. So in a way, a pop song tells something about the time. It reminds you of your childhood or whatsoever. And the good songs, they simply survive. And I think it's really similar with design because 99% disappears or goes away. And we also had a funny talk this afternoon, I think, about the definition of design, what it is. And to me, design is, you, you only have two types of things in the world. One is made by nature and the other one is made by man. And everything to me that is thought of before it was actually made is designed. And of course, it can be bad or good. Um, so that means that everything around us is designed, but not always in the best way. So it's good to be critical, but with the right criteria on it. in 10 years, 15 years? Uh, uh, well, my biggest aim I mean, your role as a designer. Yeah, well, my biggest aim is to be independent and also to be able to be independent to criticize, you know, to see my opinion as something that I can do without having double interest. Because, of course, if you work for a company, you're not going to be that critical. And I think the more independent you are, the more critical you can be in having your own footprint or your own statements. So my aim, it's a bit double because you also have to survive and make a living. Uh, so let's call it a paradox. So on one side, you have to be with one foot within the industry and try to change the parameters which are possible. And on the other hand, you want to be as independent as possible. But being independent is also expensive as a hobby. So uh, it works a bit on both ways, but for now, the producers that I work with, I'm always very curious to hear their production processes, why they produce it, where they produce it, what materials they use, what kind of paints, etc., etc. And it teaches me a lot. And a lot of companies are also really aware of it, uh, but not always that honest. Yeah. So I hope I can be as independent as possible, starting from July. <laughs> Good one. You published uh, this project with uh, Frame Magazine, and um, how often do you document your projects in that 
level so they can uh, stay uh, like um, in paper or yeah, well, in many other formats, actually you know? Actually, not, not, not enough, because when I was studying and when I graduated, actually until this project, I documented everything really well with photos, with all the steps, even with some manuals of what I did, so I could also trace it back with recipes, with knowing exactly what I did. And then I got a bit lazy because I got more and more work. So I thought, yeah, skip the process, skip the documentation, just go to the end result straight away. So I haven't done it in three years actually, which is a pity. And hopefully I can do it more and more often because to me it's a very important part. And in school we were also very consistent with it, knowing what you were doing. Because to me the process is just as important as the outcome. Mostly it is the biggest part of so I really hope I can do it more often because I actually quite uh, check out the book often because it shows every step, even half of it I already forgot, but luckily it's written down. So I would really encourage everyone to do it and not be so lazy. Changing the way you, uh, is it, A, are you including it in your design process? Are you thinking of it? Or is it something that you do not want to go towards, or doesn't fit in your design thinking? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about 3D printing of using it. Of course, I use it as a tool, like you would use a hammer mm. or a screwdriver, because sometimes if you make a computer model, it's easier to print it than to make the model with glue and sticks. Um, but there's hardly any good designs made in 3D printing. I mean, it's, it's a nice technique. There's a lot possible. I think in the medical world, they are doing really interesting stuff, in biomedical stuff. But in product design, it's sort of always a bit gimmicky or a gadget. And I actually made one object in 3D printing, which was also, it didn't really work. And, but it was with uh, stereolithography, you know, the powder, making the powder hard. And I made a sand timer, and actually it solidified the shape of the sand timer, and at the same time it had the liquid sand inside. So I tried to use the material and the technique the way it made sense for a product or for a functional thing, but it was way too difficult and it didn't work. And, uh, but I, I haven't really seen convincing designs in 3D printing to justify it. I think it came more from a technological perspective and it's being used a lot by designers as an efficient way to make things, but on a conceptual level, it's not that easy to, to hit the right button with 3D printing. So I'm not that big of a fan of it, um, and I still hope that I will be amazed of, wow, this is really good in 3D printing. But so far, I haven't really seen it. I check it out a lot. Okay. Or do you have any advices <laughs> what to look at? Well, no, I work a lot with, like, I check out work done by EAC, which is another school, and here also I've studied here in a di digital design, and we have these things, but I think we need to 3D print with more sustainable or natural materials to actually see if it's going to be used in a house, because no one wants things made just out of, you know, the plastics. Ah. So we need to, I think, encourage more new materials that can be incorporated or a mixture between traditional artisan and 3D printed objects. Yeah, well, that's exactly also the two directions of 3D printing because it originally started as cheap prototyping mm -hmm. or mold making. They could easily make a model for a die or for a prototype. And normally it would be very expensive to make a test in a complicated mm -hmm. shape. And on the other hand, um, they also use it for individual reproduction, so like a hip or food mm -hmm. or chocolate or clay. It's really, really good for building houses to adapt it in a unique way. So I think it's two paths that mm -hmm. will develop. And uh, there's a lot happening and there's definitely good stuff happening. But so far, <laughs> it's really a tool. I see it as yeah. a tool. Thank you. Beers? <laughs> Time for beer. Yeah. No, um, no, it's because we have another exhibition right ah, now. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, thank Lex. You. <laughs> um, nada, solo... 
Sí. sí. Um, solo invitaros ahora a una exposición que, que hay en la Galería de Adá, Carré Payar 74, si no cogéis un papel de estos que está a punta de la dirección. Es Parada Marina del Metro Rojo, hemos preparado una exposición muy especial que nos gustaría que, que visitarais y también compartiréis con, con nosotros. Así que espero veros ahora allí y si no mañana... Um, de cuatro, um, hay unas jornadas muy, muy especiales también que hemos preparado con mucho cariño con los invitados que hemos traído, con Alexander Taylor, Varges, Rau Colors y Mauricio Montalti en el The Hub. Empezamos a las tres y media hasta las ocho y media. Así que os veo ahora y mañana otra vez. Y nada, lo mismo, gracias a Lisaba y a todos por venir.